Today we're talking about one of the most popular jarheads on the G.I. Joe team. Today we're talking about Leatherneck. But before we do, I want to say thanks for watching JL's Comics. If you like the video, hit the thumbs up and subscribe. I do upload videos just like this every week. All right, let's jump into the story. Before he was Leatherneck, he was Wendell Metzger from Stromsburg, Nebraska. Wendell grew up and enlisted in the USMC, immediately solidifying himself as the toughest of all the boots in his barracks combined. Eager to start training, Metzger would wake everyone up, including his DI, even before Reveille at 4.30 in the morning. He rose up quickly, becoming the meanest corporal in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. He then became the roughest tech sergeant in the 1st Recon Battalion during the Vietnam War. And after the war, Metzger transitioned to being the toughest DI on Paris Island, and then the hardest gunny to ever slog through the mud of Camp Lejeune. They say that men who have gone through his training would rather crawl over broken glass than be on his bad side. Leatherneck demands countless push-ups for mistakes and enjoys leading 30-mile hikes through hot and humid Paris Island swamps. He has to be the toughest to prepare his soldiers for the worst. After all this experience, and as great as their first Marine gung-ho is, Metzger became the most leathery Leatherneck to ever join the G.I. Joe team, where he debuted in Larry Hama's A Real American Hero comic book series with issue 49. In his first operational mission, which was an all-out assault on the town of Springfield to rescue Ripcord, Leatherneck was on the assault team with Snake Eyes, Scarlet, Quicksilver, Ricondo, Spirit, Torp, and Beachhead. They were tasked with leading an attack and taking out power, comms, and water systems to the entire town. It was basically a cameo appearance. This debut was with issue 50 and the dramatic splash page at the beginning of the issue as the team rescued Ripcord. Once they grabbed him, they commandeered the nearest wheels, a big trash truck from Springfield's sanitation department. Snake Eyes hotwired the dustbin lorry and had guns ablaze as they pushed forward. Meanwhile, it was up to Leatherneck and Beachhead to cover their rear, and they more than did their job. Shortly after this, Generals Ryan, Hollingsworth, and Dyson were at the pit for an inspection. Well, it was more of an investigation after the attack on Springfield, but they were in the subterranean sections of the pit. So above ground, Beachhead was wrestling with Leatherneck, this big rivalry happening. And shortly after this, Leatherneck was with Beachhead, Lowlight, and Stalker as they moved on a Cobra terror drone in Sierra Gordo to rescue Snake Eyes, who'd been captured. Lowlight sniped a Viper with a hypodermic dart. He then took the Viper's uniform and infiltrated the terror drone, punched out another Viper, and then located Snake Eyes and directed the rest of the team to their location for the rescue. On the way out, Stalker was hit, so Leatherneck took command. Downing a helicopter with his M203, then ordered Beachhead and Lowlight to carry Stalker to a tree line where he and Snake Eyes could check him out. Out. It was immediately apparent that Stalker was hit in a bad shape. They'd have to stretcher him out. Snake Eyes took Leatherneck's rifle and mounted Lowlight's Starlight Scope on it, a holding action while Leatherneck and the team took their squad leader down the trail. In issue 62, when Outback, depressed and despondent, made it back to the pit after the ordeal in Barovia, Leatherneck was angry, upset at the thought that Outback would leave Stalker and the team behind. Outback had returned with intel on Stalker's orders, but he couldn't say anything, so when Leatherneck tried to fight him, all he could do was pull out his knife on the Marine. Then in issue 64, Leatherneck was at the barracks and met the new recruits, Fast Draw, Law, Order, Falcon, Chuckles, Backstop, and Psych Out. He met them and started yelling at Crankcase about their papers, their clearance, to be let down into the pit, and to know about the, you know, space shuttle parked outside. And then he turned his bad attitude toward the recruits themselves. During Cobra Civil War, Leatherneck was on the weapons team with Hawk. They flew in on a tomahawk that was also carrying Dr. Mindbender. The chopper touched down on the airfield's tarmac, and they were some of the first boots on the ground for the battle. They had to clear the airfield so the Herks could land. Cobra Commander's force were attacking the west end of the airfield, along with a column of Zartan's maggots, while Serpentor's troops bore down on the east end of the runway, just as Destro's troops made their beach landing behind them. They were right in the middle, and in the middle of the ensuing battle, Leatherneck started complaining about how it had turned into a fiasco and the person who planned it should be right there in the mix with him. After the battle ceased, the Joes were arrested by MPs due to the shenanigans of some generals. In issue 83, Leatherneck was on the team that helped set up a fake pit after they got intel from Captain Min that Cobra was going to attack. And it wouldn't be until many years later when Leatherneck showed up again, now with ARAH issue 175. Scarlet went to the pit saying hello to everybody along the way and ran into Leatherneck who was pushing a cart around the garage. That's not really what he's been doing the entire time. He had plenty of off-panel things to take care of, like eating Roadblock's barbecue, complaining about nothing and yet everything, yelling at new recruits, yelling at wetsuit, and shaking his fist angrily at passing clouds. By issue 185, a Joe unit was captured in Benzene as the Crytron device plot continued to unfold. A fire team was then sent in to rescue them. And this team was Leatherneck, Spirit, Falcon, and Zap. 
They were to be inserted with a newly modified X-19 Bravo stealth fighter. The frame was extended to allow for a set of four seats behind the pilot. So the plane landed on a prefab landing strip set up in the middle of the desert, which was set up by Ripcord. They set up a hide in the dunes outside of the prison facility where the team was being held. And then the same one where Farood and Darklon showed up to demonstrate that the Krytron device works by triggering a nuclear explosion. With Leatherneck on RTO or FRO duty, Duke advised them to pull out. Falcon shot the radio dead before that advisory became in order. Instead of retreating, they dropped their rucks and charged. At the wall of the compound with guns firing on full auto, Leatherneck yelled, Keep up the pace! We don't want to die rested, do we? Falcon ended up taking a round to the face, which sucks, but the distraction from that allowed Leatherneck and Zap to take out an MG tower that had had them pinned down. Despite his injury, the fire team managed to arrest Darklon. As he was face down in the stand with a pair of flex cuffs being put on him, Leatherneck yelled out that they needed to form up line abreast and press forward. And they took the compound, rescued their teammates, just as the extraction team showed up to take them back. After Robert Graves was captured by terrorists in Sierra Gordo on live television, Leatherneck was assigned to Bravo Team along with Beachhead, Lowlight, Downtown, Bazooka, and Lifeline. As Alpha Team set up for their advance to the terror drone where the hostages were being held, a tomahawk set Bravo Team down in a lumber yard, quote, somewhere north of Rio Lindo, unquote. On the ground, Beachhead and Leatherneck ran a perimeter check while the rest of the team formed up a security circle. They were there as backup for Alpha Team, so they set up their tents, and Leatherneck was eating an MRE, and he said to Beachhead that they're an improvement. Beachhead replied, his lack of taste buds a requirement in the Marines, and Leatherneck quipped, affirmative. Comes with biting the bullet while the other services sit in the rear and lollygag. But this banter was actually cut short because Leatherneck spotted an incoming RPG. An enemy company attacked them from the tree line. But they were overrun, captured, and strung up on racks with their hands tied. They somehow escaped off panel, and in the firefight, Bazooka was wounded. Hiking through the jungle with a stretcher, Leatherneck took point while Beachhead was on drag. Bazooka said, I'm slowing y'all down, leave me here. And Stalker said, no way, and Leatherneck told him, we don't leave a Joe behind, no matter what. So they set up a bunch of traps to take out the pursuing enemy, which turned out to be Revanche Robotics cyborgs. One trap until Leatherneck jumping out of a river with a machete and chopping the cyborg's head off in one slice. That's when Duke and Gung Ho showed up in a Chinook to take them back to the rest of the Joes. On the way back from a mission, they were redirected to Halo Jump into the newly failed state of Trucial Abysmia to rescue the Ambassador. On the way down from Angels 20, Leatherneck's chute caught a gust of wind and he drifted off course by about 100 yards to where he landed on another roof outside the compound. He jumped off the roof and landed on a van, Deadpool superhero landing style. Airborne was waving strobes at him to guide him back to the compound, and all that commotion excited the locals and it stirred up a half dozen technicals and a ton of hostiles. Ambassador McRory showed up with a shotgun. Luckily, he's, as he says, he was a recon marine and wouldn't be dead weight. Leatherneck and some of the guys were up at the roof parapets with their rifles and one saw. It was this whole 13 hours Benghazi situation. One of the tangos opened up with a Soviet belt-fed HMG in one of the pickups, so Leatherneck responded in kind as per ROE. A Sea King was supposed to evac them all, but an RPG shot it down and the massive helo crashed. So they put grenades under the fallen tangos and escaped through a sewer tunnel, stole a pair of technicals, even as the enemy flipped over the bodies of their peers and the compound blew up. And they sped and blasted their way out of town. A guy named Ishmael was driving one of the two trucks, but he died after taking numerous AK rounds. And the truck crashed, so Leatherneck jumped off the pickup to check it out and grabbed the ambassador who had his own badass moment. Once a marine, always a marine, Leatherneck said. And actually, his security detail were Dark Horse 3-5, that's 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, an amazingly heroic group of soldiers who went to hell and back in South Afghanistan in 2010. And the other, with the ambo, was a cadre at Marsoc. So they were all Marines. Leatherneck wanted to take care of them. We take care of our own, he said. And with the oil leaking all over from the crashed truck and the ambassador's two security now wounded, he borrowed Leatherneck's cover, his hat, and firearm and ran out to meet the advancing enemy to buy the rest of the team time to escape. And he shot the oil, blew himself up, killing all the tangos himself and saving the Joes and his two friends. Semper Fi, Devil Dog, Leatherneck said. His next mission paired him up with CoverGirl, Dusty, Repeater, and Muskrat along with a Chenoweth DPV and a Flyer GMV in a small war-torn country named Shazadar. Record Heavy Duty and Airborne had dropped in to rescue three UN relief workers who'd gone dark, but they were missing too. 
So this new team with Leatherneck had to rescue all six of them, and quickly they met up with Tangos and some more technicals. They ended up finding their targets along with a busload from an orphanage, and they escorted them all to a C-130 for exfil. And in the Mad Max car chase to the plane, Leatherneck was out on the hood of the flyer shooting back at the trucks. When Sean Collins' Snake Eyes was captured by Cobra, Leatherneck was one of the first Joes in line to go to Springfield to rescue him. And so he jumped on one of the buses to that town. And that's where he is in the fall of 2020, on a bus in Springfield, surrounded by Cobra. In a companion book, Special Missions, Leatherneck made a couple of appearances too, like the third issue, where he was in the Middle East with Stalker, Crankcase, and Slipstream on an up-armored van. They'd gotten the location of SAM sites and uploaded them for a U.S. airstrike, and they quickly went to a nearby airbase. It turns out the airstrike was a distraction so that Slipstream could get on the base and steal a Russian Yak-36, which was the latest at the time in Soviet VTOL technology. In Special Missions 4, Leatherneck was with Roadblock and Lifeline in a PBY Catalina that had a Cobra Firebat in the hold, and which was piloted by Wild Bill when they were shot down by the October Guard in a Soviet attack helicopter. Lifeline was pissing off Leatherneck because he wouldn't pick up a weapon to fight. Leatherneck was also in Special Missions 8. The cover shows him grabbing low light as they take off a C-47 and put him over a drop zone in Southeast Asia with a CIA contact who put them onto their target, a purported traitor and spy. Then in Special Mission 23, he was on a team with a new guy named Scoop. You know how Leatherneck feels about gomers and greenhorns. They're all Bravo Foxtrot to him. He got a good spot on the cover of G.I. Joe European Missions as well, the American reprint of UK Action Force Monthly. Here, he was in London and flew in a window to rescue an ambassador from CG's. Leatherneck got to shoot a bat in the face while Sci-Fi saved him from a second bat. It turns out that this whole thing was a test exercise to measure the effectiveness of the building's security protocols. And then he made a few other cameo appearances here and there through the series. In the winter of 88, Leatherneck made it onto a poster for G.I. Joe magazine, which showed him jumping out of a tomahawk along with Tunnel Rat Roadblock and Chuckles. On the animated side, Chuck McCann voiced Leatherneck for the Sunbow series. On the show, Leatherneck's frequently with his partner Wetsuit, and the Navy Marine rivalry never more alive and fiery with these two. Because of the timing of his release, Leatherneck debuted in the second season of the show, with the first part of Arise Serpentor Arise, the multi-part season opener event. We get to see him training in the beginning and later guarding Alexander the Great's tomb. In G.I. Joe and the Golden Fleece, Leatherneck was one of the G.I. Joe team that was sent back to ancient Greece. And in the episode Let's Play Soldier, Leatherneck was in Thailand with Beachhead, Gung Ho, and Lolite, where Dr. Mindbender was making a brainwashing concoction from tree sap, and Leatherneck actually became a father-like figure to some dust children. In The Rotten Egg, Leatherneck gets to drive the Silver Mirage. And then in Once Upon a Joe, he drives a recon sled. He actually ends up a vehicle driver quite a few times. Raised the flag where he was operating a killer whale, or in Joe's Night Out, Leatherneck was with Wetsuit again, getting ready to go to a new club, and Wetsuit said, I don't think they'll let you they have an IQ minimum at the door. So they rolled up on the club in LCB recon sleds, and grumpy Leatherneck didn't like his date named Madeline. And it turns out that the club, it was a trap, and Serpentor shot the club into space, and yeah, that happened. In My Favorite Things, Leatherneck was with Wetsuit, Dial Tone, and Beachhead, Flint, LJ, and Lowlight in the Netherlands. Wetsuit and Leatherneck were going back and forth about picking a restaurant. He said, your idea of gourmet food is sea rations sautéed with dog food, he told Leatherneck. Later, after a seawall broke, Leatherneck fought with Serpentor underwater, and he was almost killed by a guillotine. Later, Wetsuit told him a seal would have brought back Serpentor's head. Mainframe figured out that Serpentor's face turned into Vlad Tepish, so they went to attack Dracula's castle, and Leatherneck is one of the guys floating down in a falcon glider. The Marine then had to rescue Navy as he dove into the water, and again later, when Wetsuit fell off a beam after fighting with a bat. See, they fight a lot, but they're truly battle buddies. Leatherneck complained about a splinter, which turned out to be a poison dart from Serpentor, and Leatherneck collapsed on the ground. I guess this is goodbye, Froggy, he said. Wetsuit carried his unconscious teammate away. Wetsuit and Lifeline then went to India to get some of Serpentor's blood to counter the poison and save Leatherneck. Wetsuit was wounded and wound up in a hospital bed next to Leatherneck, and as friends, they picked up their banter right away. In the most dangerous thing in the world, Cobra hacked the database and promoted shipwreck dial tone and lifeline to colonels. Leatherneck was almost injured when he was moving a crate with wetsuit and it almost fell on him. So they fought and they wrestled and later the two were in an MBT mauler on the firing range for an exercise directed by Shipwreck. And Shipwreck told him they were moving along like an old lady in a wheelchair. I know someone I'd like to put in a wheelchair, Wetsuit said, referring to Leatherneck. And this is one of the few times that Leatherneck and Wetsuit actually agreed on something. The most dangerous thing in the world is a green officer in the dark with a book of matches, Leatherneck said. 
And so Wetsuit replied, Amen to that, brother. Amen to that. In Ninja Holiday, he was in the South Pacific as this guy was raiding Joe bases in the area on orders from Serpentor. Leathernack actually calls Sergeant Slaughter a glory hound for not waiting for him before he attacked a fort. Later, Leatherneck and Wetsu turned to each other to argue, and without missing a beat, both punched two attackers out cold without looking away from one another. Leatherneck also had a PSA of his own telling kids that sun without sunblock is bad, so I guess that leathery skin is frowned upon despite his name. Leatherneck's first action figure hit toy shelves in 1986, bearing quite the resemblance to Hasbro figure designer Ron Rudat, mustache and all. And this Marine came with an M16 that had an underslung M203 grenade launcher. The same year, he was also included in the TRU exclusive Special Missions Brazil box set, which came with a cassette tape that told him of the special mission to the cobra-infested jungles of Brazil. He also made it onto the box art for Sergeant Slaughter's Triple T. Also in 86, Leatherneck was featured in the Battle Stations television commercial. He was getting a big push when he was released. In 93, Leatherneck was carded as the Infantry Training Specialist, and he was part of Battle Corps. He now had lots of guns and an orange missile launcher. In 2001, Leatherneck joined Gung Ho for a two-pack. And for spy troops, Leatherneck then became the operator slash driver for the Mobile Command Center. He's also listed as a weapons and tactics instructor. Then, in 2004, he became the defense mech driver for the Valor vs. Venom line, where he's also listed as Marine Force Recon. Then in 2008, Leatherneck was boxed with a tan Ostriker. This was a tan repaint of one that Target put out earlier that year. Leatherneck was boxed with yet another vehicle in 2011, this time for the ROC Tiger Claw ATV. He then got to join the second Mission Brazil box set that same year for a Jocon that took place in Orlando, Florida. His file card here says that Captain Claymore chose him to be the team's Grenadier Specialist and protect their six from the drag position. He's ruthlessly effective here, but it also allowed him to be separated from wetsuit, keep their banter down, and keep their noise discipline in check. And then Leatherneck came out in 2014 for the 50th anniversary wave and in the Eagle's Edge set along with Hawk and Destro. To summarize Leatherneck, we once again turn to his V1 file card. He is uncouth, opinionated, and overbearing, and he has no patience at all for the indecisive, the lazy, and the dishonest. Not a man you can like, but one you can trust. Indeed. However, he is a man that many of us like. And with that, that is a wrap on this one, my friends. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to subscribe so you can be one of the first to know when I upload videos just like this each and every week. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.